I'm Adam Myers and I lead the distribution team at Pingana. Thank you for joining us for this webinar update with Peter Bourne, the co-portfolio manager of the Harding Lovner Global Equity Strategy. This is the strategy that is implemented in both the Pingana International Equities Fund, as well as the listed version, which trades on the ASX as PIA. From a format perspective, I've asked Peter to keep his prepared marks, his prepared remarks section um, reasonably short, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So please, any questions you have about the fund, the macroeconomic environment, specific exposures, um, enter them into the, the Q&A box, which you can access from the icon on your screen, and hopefully we can have a, a really interesting conversation after the prepared section. Um, Peter, over to you. Adam and everybody, thank you for your time. I'm going to jump right in. Um, Harding Lovner is about 35 years old. We're a quality growth investment firm. I've been at the firm for 25 years. I have been a co-lead portfolio manager in the strategy for 20 years. What we're showing you on this slide is just a high level uh, depiction of what we mean by quality growth investing. We find businesses that are demonstrably more profitable than the market. Uh, they are lower risk in terms of lower standard deviation of return on equities over a cycle, lower financial leverage, and they are structurally faster growing in terms of faster sales growth, faster earnings growth, and faster cash flow growth. That's what we mean by a quality growth uh, company. And that's what we focus on. We have about 425 of these businesses around the world, and we bottom up portfolio construct world, uh, depending on valuation and diversification. So that's what we're all about. Let's take a look at the next slide. I, I want to back up. So you're probably aware we're having a very poor performance period. Actually, the about the worst in my 20, year, 20 years is, is doing this in these last nine months. But I want to zoom out a bit, put a little bit in perspective. We have looked over rolling five-year periods since we have a very long global equity track record. And, and what we find is that we have a distinctive pattern of performance typically over, over time. And what, it, what you're looking at is on the horizontal axis, you're looking at returns of the market. And on the, and on the vertical, you're looking at our relative performance. And the green dots obviously are that all the different five rolling five-year periods in, over the period. And what you'll see is in 85% of the time, the portfolio has outperformed moderate market environments. That's single digit market returns. 96% uh, of the time, the portfolio has outperformed falling markets. And then in strong markets, which are markets of double digit performance, it's, 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 it's a jump ball. 53% of the time we have outperformance on rolling uh, five year periods. Uh, what I want to point out is if you look at when we've underperformed historically, uh, those green dots that you see in the in the shaded area below the vertical the, the diagonal line, that has been periods of distinct dial pressure where low quality businesses uh, where have historically low low uh, trailing sales growth, low um, lower returns on capital, higher leverage. We've had periods where those kind of companies have been very, very strong share price performance relative to the share price performance of the kind of companies that we invest in. And the 0203 period as an example is, is, is one of that, the middle of a 12, the middle of 13 is another. That's typically when we've underperformed and we've found ourselves uh, challenged with a again in a in, in a style period, a style shift period that frankly I, I just did not see coming in severity. Let's go to the next slide. So the, let's go to the bottom of the of the page just to look at the year to date. So we're looking at performance of companies across quality quintiles, growth quintiles, and valuation quintiles, just to give you a sense. And this may be old hat to you, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But what, what, these, what these graphs are showing you is that companies in the highest quality quintile have meaningfully underperformed companies in the lowest quality quintile. Companies that have been fastest growing have very meaningfully underperformed companies that have been slower growing. Companies that are most expensive on traditional metrics have been meaningfully under, underperforming companies that have been less expensive on traditional metrics of PE and so forth. And so I'm not sure that's news to anybody, but a very good piece of the underperformance that we have been um, putting up, which I know is, uh, is, is, is disappointing, is because we find ourselves in this, uh, in this style headwind. It's, it's not 100% of it. In fact, it's about 40% of it, but it is a, a meaningful, uh, explanatory factor in the poor performance that we have uh, put up. So let's take a look at that. 
And uh, we're and this this is this is um, the timing of this joining as we kind of are looking at the peak performance of growth coming out of the pandemic, and now we're down uh, where growth has been significantly underperforming. So we're about a thousand even more basis points behind relatively in a trailing 12 month or so period. Let's keep going. I have two more slides, uh, and then I want to see what's on your mind, and maybe we can share share views on a, a whole series of uh, questions that are all of us that have in our, in our minds. Uh, so the uncertain environment, uh, I'm not going to spend any time on inflation, recession, stagflation. I don't think anybody knows. We all know that there is a, a, a tightening period, possible recession, uh, possible severity. We don't know. My point is, it's likely cyclical. In other words, it's likely transient. We've seen it before. We'll see it again. Rates come up, economy slows down, rates get cut, economy comes back. The question is, how long does it take? What happens in the interim? Nobody quite knows, but that's cyclical. We've kind of seen it before. I'm going to say it's a known playbook. Now, there's a chance, okay, somebody could say we're going into structural deflation for a decade or two, maybe, but I think most people should, uh, believe it's going to be a cyclical macroeconomic environment we're in. Uh, let's go to the next point, geopolitical. I think what we're, no, sorry, same slide, second point. Uh, I think, I don't know about you, but I think here in the States and we travel around and talk to people, it just feels like we can see structural changes in the world happening right in front of our eyes this calendar year. We obviously have Russia and then with the China bromance between Putin and Xi. Uh, we have the changing U.S. policy. I'm not sure if that's been news in Australia or not, but what we're witnessing in the United States under the Biden administration this year is kind of the emergence of what appears to be a U.S. industrial policy, which I don't think those countries had before, but I think it's got far-reaching consequences, and it's further fracturing what was already a fragile U.S.-China relationship. With most recently, you've read that the China, the Biden administration has imposed these sweeping sanctions across the Chinese technology landscape to set the kind of the playbook that was used on Huawei. We have a U.S. administration explicitly subsidizing manufacture of biotechnology and biomanufacturing in the U.S. We have $100 billion or so of direct and indirect subsidies coming into clean energy, EV, electric vehicle production in the United States as part of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. And that's uh, explicitly trying to prohibit Chinese supply chain components from coming into uh, the U.S. And, and, and then, of course, we're trying to increasingly limit U.S. technology from going into China in any number of areas. Uh, we, and we, of course, the, the semiconductor uh, su subsidy hack, trying to get advanced semiconductors here. So the United States has not pursued this type of thing before. Uh, there's a whole series of implications and risks, but now we appear to have, you know, China doing its preferred manufacturing strategy, Japan, Europe, historically, now the U.S. So I think what we're seeing is, uh, now it may sound dramatic, it may not be accurate, but I, I think it is a point of no return in this separation between U.S. and China which is a structurally big deal with a lot of risks that I don't think we, any of us can possibly uh, foretell or completely understand. And of course, the, the, the word that we continually hear from companies now is supply chain, nearshoring, reshoring, rethinking. And, 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 and that brings lots of potential investment opportunities for companies that are helping businesses not only intelligently restructure their supply chains, but bring the latest and greatest manufacturing technologies into their plants. And we're seeing a lot of activity and opportunity there in, in companies that we have in the portfolio and that we follow. So while all of this stuff, the cyclical uh, inflation that's causing all this anxiety and dislocation, we have these structural issues. For us, it's the same playbook of, look, uncertainty and volatility creates opportunities when we are dealing with quality growth businesses that have the balance sheets and the cash flows for resilience. And so we are really focused on not as much talking about recession here, that it may happen, it may be deep, it may be shallow, but we're talking about resilience. We are after resilient companies that will be powering through this type of uncertainty at attractive prices brought about by all the dislocation in the markets. Last slide. You heard it before, you'll hear it again, patience. I know it's not a great prescription, <laughs> It may, it may, in fact, sound obnoxious. I'm sorry if it does. But for a quality growth firm like Harding Lovner, and I, we've been in 20 years, occasionally we get rough patches and we are patient. We carefully 
allocate capital to the strongest quality growth businesses in the world that are at attractive valuations, and we let the compounding work over time. It's like the magic of compounding and bails us out. I don't expect to go through this chart in detail unless you have questions. Here's the punchline. Last 20 years, we're showing you on the horizontal line. You can say I could assume I exit at any time along that top horizontal line and I enter any time along the, the diagonal line. I go in, I exit. What would my experience have been? We show you that there's red, which is initial underperformance during a style, a headwind, and green is the payoff that comes from patiently letting the companies compound. We show you challenge period number one in the early 2000s, challenge period number two, 2013, 14, and our current uh, existing challenge period, which just came after strong outperformance after COVID, did not, I personally did not see the extent of this entrenched uh, supply chain, inflation, monetary stimulus mess, complications of the war, et cetera, as being as bad as this. And as a result of that, performance a little worse than I'd like. And you can see we had very strong performance in the dark period. Now we have weak performance. We have every reason to believe that this period, as in prior periods, will see green following red for investors who want to have a bit of a time frame. I told you it wasn't going to be a great prescription, but that's it. It's patience and compounding. Okay, that's it from me in terms of any, quote, prepared remarks. And I'm anxious to hear what's on your mind. Thanks, Peter. Um, we do have a few questions that have already come through, but I would like to start with one of my own first, if I may. And that is that inflation and underperformance are seeming to go hand in hand at the moment. So what do you think is priced in or should investors just expect um, a strategy like this to struggle until um, central banks in the world are able to, to collectively break the back of inflation? That's a difficult question. It's a good question. Uh, in terms of what's priced in, let, let me try to answer that this way. You know what? In our estimation, every 10 basis point increase in discount rate is like a one and a half to two percent decrease in fair value, estimated fair value. That's like what we see. What we do at Harding Lovner in our discount models is we use a 6% real discount rate, real rate, 6% real. We don't change it when, when, when the market's down or up, we keep it 6% real. We make adjustments for company strength, okay? What I'm saying is right now in the United States, just give you an example for a financially AAA balance for a very strong balance sheet company, our real rate of return requirement in our models is 5.6% plus inflation. So why am I telling you that? In the prior years, the last four, five, six years, until about the beginning of this year, we've found many, many, many business looking expensive on our valuation models. And we had to kind of live with that. Now we find many of the same businesses undervalued or fairly valued on our valuation models using that high real discount rate. So what I'm saying is, I think a lot has been priced in to where we can use high real rate of return discount models, which we've always tried to use, but we see absolute valuation support, whereas before it was always looking at relative. Well, this one's less relatively overvalued looking than that one. So that's the first thing. Second thing, when will it turn? I think as soon as the investors can see two things, the end in sight for the rate rises, and then get a sense for how bad is the economic damage or lack of a damage going to be. The, the, the best possible outcome for us, in my opinion, is you get to see that that rate rise is going to plateau and start to gently fall off. And we're going to get difficult growth conditions so that not every company can grow. So you go back to the scarcity premium idea, but not a collapse. So you're in a very serious recession. Even then, I think growth companies will end up outperforming. The, the negative scenario we should keep in mind, like, I mean, like, let's just say you think, what? That's crazy. We're going to have rates that are going to keep rising for six, eight quarters, and we're going to have high and sustained stagflation. Then I think you should go to cash. And, and then <laughs> quality growth, I think, will outperform other types of equity, but then I think cash will continue to outperform equity. So we don't have a crystal ball, but we have an idea, two points. Valuations are now coming back toward absolute levels where they're fair to attractive for the highest quality growth companies that we see. And two, we think that 
when investors begin to sense that the rate rises have begun to do their job and the and the economy is slowing, but not breaking, you know, then I think we'll be in a sweet spot. So, so if we don't necessarily go into a stagflation environment, but inflation hangs around for a, for a lot longer, have you have you factored that into your into your thought process? Adam, I had a Wi-Fi interruption, and I'm sorry, but I couldn't follow you. I hope it's stable now. I, I, I just said if we don't go into a stagflation type environment, but inflation does hang around for for a lot longer, it proves not to be as as transient as as you expect. Um, sort of, what are you what are your thoughts about that from an investment perspective? I think we win. If, if we have if we have mid mid single digit, I'm not an economist, but if we have inflation that's 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 not continuing to rise, if we have four, five, four, let's say four percent inflation that's sticky, and, and and we have slow growth, mild recession, or just continues continue to bump along, which I would think we would have. I think I think our companies win. I think growth is scarce, and the valuations have already reset on the higher interest rate base. Don't forget, companies we have are generating strong cash flows. They tend to have pricing power. There's a lot of innovation and they're, and, and they're growing. They will also use their balance sheets to take advantage of weakened competitors or other opportunities. So they will be taking and buying back their stock. These managements will not be standing still. This is not a static situation. These are dynamic companies with dynamic management teams that are seeing opportunities to create value in more difficult markets. So I, in, in the scenario that you outlined, I don't think we're going to get great absolute returns, but I think you'll see relative returns improve. And would you expect higher turnover in the portfolio um, as, as what, whatever is going to uh, unfold unfolds, basically? As, as, as you see the environment adapting, would you expect um, a higher rate of turnover in the portfolio? Not necessarily. Not for the first 12, 18 months anyway, in the previous two underperformance periods I've been a part of, 02, 03, mid-12, mid-13, our portfolio turnover just dove to zero. Why is that? Because we liked what we owned better than what we didn't own. In this last quarter, we didn't have one new completed transaction. Now, we're almost through buying one software company that we think is attractively valued and out of favor, but we didn't complete it, and we're only allowed to talk about completed transactions. But we, what, what we've seen in the past, we're seeing it again, is the portfolio turnover falls because we like what we have more than anything we don't have. And we work on consolidating positions uh, slowly but steadily in periods like this, typically. Make, makes sense. Thank you. Mo moving away from inflation now to China, you guys um, have been reducing your, your Chinese exposure, but there is still some Chinese um, exposure in the portfolio. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your, your thoughts about the China um, headwinds and opportunities? Well, you know, if you ask somebody, China's a big deal, right? It's, it's on the headlines. U.S.-China is probably the central risk dynamic in the world today. If you want to put China along with Russia as a bromance, as they described it. But, you know, what is it? It's, it's, it's less than 4% of the global index now. I mean, China is de minimis in the global index in terms of listed stocks, but it is an 800 pound gorilla in terms of driving global uh, geopolitical risk um, characteristics along with the United States. Uh, so that's just one point. It's ironic is it's got this, I think, large and, and, and justifiably large uh, impact on global geopolitical and other types of um, risk uh, dynamics and characteristics, but it's very small now in terms of listed stocks in a global index. Personally, I've been shocked. I've been actually extremely disappointed with China this entire calendar year. I, I, really, I really thought China would do, make different decisions this year than they've been making. I have been disappointed comprehensively, by, and, and just personally, on, 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 on policy decisions from how they've handled the real estate, COVID, um, their domestic economy, and, and then how they've chosen to handle lots of international geopolitical situations. And, including Taiwan and, um, and Russia. So uh, the impact of that is, along with the falling demographic, uh, the birth rates in China, is I, I really have found the risk return characteristics, in my opinion, 
in general in China uh, today versus a couple of years ago to be far less attractive. Uh, so that's my, my sense that we have lots of investment opportunities, particularly at current prices outside of China. And then of course, with the recent actions taken by the US to try to kneecap the Chinese semiconductor industry, technology industry, broadly speaking, we're gonna to have to wait and see, but that's not good news. That's also gonna bring down growth rates and capabilities and bring disruption. Now, uh, within all of that, we have got a very small overweight in China, 50 bips or something like that. And we have had uh, poor Chinese stock selection this year uh, on top of that. And we've obviously seen a lot of news about the, the non-performing loans in China. Um, we've actually got a question here um, asking if you know anything about um, the extent of the, the non-performing loans um, in China. But, but, but further to that, and, and, and definitely answer that if you do, but further to that, um, you, you've still got an exposure in, in Chinese um, country garden services, which is definitely impacted by, by that whole scenario. Uh, yes, so China, China, Country Garden Services is a, um, is, uh, if you just look at it in isolation, it's an interesting uh, company, which is a service business, a large recurring revenue book of business, uh, pricing for free cash flow, strong margins, and a net cash balance sheet. Uh, we made a mistake there in that uh, when we looked at the Chinese real estate industry, we actually broke the industry into two components. We said, here's the services capability in the industry sector. And then we said, here's the property development side. And we said they were, they were, they were separate but related. We did not ever think that the well-publicized and well-flagged uh, Chinese desire to restructure the property development side would result in the implosion of the entire Chinese property development sector. If you look at the property development sector, there are a series of bad actors who have been private and a series of very good actors who have been private. And we thought, this is great. The Chinese government is finally taking down the bad actors, the evergreens, the ever the over leveraged, irresponsible actors. And because it's such an important industry, they're going to restructure the property development, take down the bad actors, leave it with the good actors and country garden Holdings, which is a sister company on the property development side with no cross shareholdings, very good long term track record, good prudent management, and so on. We thought this company will end up in a better position as the industry is restructured. It didn't work out that way for some unintended consequences as well. And the entire property development sector has been thrown into uh, con confusion and contagion. And of course, that has had ripple effects over to the property services side because of lack of new product flow. Uh, that will start to that will that, that will um, start to dry up, and the market has priced um, knocked down the price of Country Garden because of anticipated growth rate going down. So that's been a mess. The only good news I can tell you on that front is recently the Chinese government I, I think might be um, might be beginning to change the uh, the view because they started to guarantee the the bonds of some of the property development development companies particularly, especially including Country Garden Holdings, uh, so that it, it, they've begun to say, okay, we can't allow the bank run to continue to dry up financing the panic on all the developers. And so we're hoping that that's the, that's the beginning of the turnaround and saying, okay, now we can't just have the entire sector demolished or left within the state. We need to keep some of the high quality private guys there too. And instead of bankrupting the whole sector, let's now guarantee some bonds uh, calm the contagion and see if we can, you know, go back up the path toward rational development. And if that's if that's the case, then I think we're going to see a very good but prolonged recovery in, in the in the in the services company. If that's not the case, we won't. M makes sense. And do you have any idea of the sort of the extent of the non-performing loans in in the the Chinese property sector? Oh, I don't know about non-performing loans in the property development sector. The bonds are at discounts. Uh, I don't. I, I know. I, 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 you know, I don't. I'm sorry. I, I don't. I, I can't give you any, uh, any, any, any. I can't quantify that. I, I just our, our banking analyst may be able to do it, but I, I can't. I'm sorry. No, no, no problem at all. Um, 
But you did also refer to um, the chip sector there um, and the, the impact of, of the recent US action. Um, it's obviously a tough sector. We've seen um, downgrade, downgrades to guidance from AMD, Intel, Intel um, pressure on TSMC. Um, can you give us a little bit more perspective of your thoughts? You've obviously still got exposure to, to NVIDIA as well in the portfolio. Yeah, NVIDIA is, I mean, we bought NVIDIA uh, after the stock, you know, back in 2018 when the stock got hammered and got hammered again. And, and then when the stock went up something like seven times, then we cut it aggressively and brought it down to a minimum 1% position in the portfolio. And then it's, it's at the end of the year, and then it's corrected since then. I mean, for me, um, NVIDIA is a name you just want to own. You want to you want to manage the position size best you can. And we, I, mean, I said it had this huge run, and we, we cut it down. In retrospect, it would have been wise to sell it and buy it back. But of course, you never know how to do that if, when you it's, you can't. It's very difficult to check, catch the bottom because they turn before they you think they will. Uh, but NVIDIA, to me, so I, I, look to me the most attractive. Barbell in, in semiconductors is NVIDIA on one hand and a name like Synopsys on the other hand. So what, let me just try to quickly contrast them because I think they work and we have them in the portfolio. Synopsys, as you probably or you may know, there's one of two companies that have 90% share in, the, in, in chip design software, which has become extremely complicated. Synopsys and Cadence. Synopsys is, is a recurring revenue model where you have three-year ratable contracts that are, that are priced per seat to chip R&D designers who are four, three, four, five years ahead of whatever whatever's currently happening in semiconductors. So the, the revenue is, is, is completely delinked from the cyclicality of SEMIs. And, and there are more and more and more and more R&D engineers across hyperscalers, across industrials, across that, that are licensing synopsis design software. So that's the, we have a bigger position in synopsis. So that's, that's one bookend. The other one, the reason I think you gotta own NVIDIA and just suck it up through the down cycles and then add and, and, and hold it, is I, I really believe that in the future, the economy will in fact be characterized by artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms running across all industry. And I think in three, five, seven years, we're gonna see that. NVIDIA, I believe, is emerging as the go-to foundation and framework enabling that type of activity. And they are working on enterprise software model where they will be rec generating recurring revenue per seat from, from, um, those, from those industrial users. So NVIDIA has a leading new product cycle that enables breakthroughs across that type of capability. And they're bringing in more and more of a software enterprise software model uh, to, to, to knit it all together on top of that. Now it might sound airy fairy, but I don't think it's going to be. I think that's what's gonna unfold and NVIDIA is in a very strong position and they're coming out with a whole new product cycle pretty soon here. So, but you've got to deal with the cycles unless you're really good at picking the bottoms and the tops and most of us aren't. Now, Taiwan Semi, right? Well, we still own Taiwan Semi. You know the, you, you know the argument. You don't get any progress in the semi environment in the semi industry without Taiwan Semi. It's just that simple. So if you, believe semis have gone X growth, then you don't want to own any of them, including NVIDIA. But if you believe that the world's advancing along the same types of new tech cycles that we've seen year after year after year after year, then you, you, then you do want to retain exposure, in my opinion. The China, thing, the China thing is a, is a setback and we have to figure out we have to figure out company by company who's most exposed. Now, in applied materials, which dominates certain areas of, of manufacturing, it probably has 30% of its sales in China. Maybe a third of those are at the advanced end, and maybe a third. So maybe that's going to be exposed. Maybe they lose all the China sales. So maybe we'll be maybe we need to move capital out of a name like that into an NVIDIA or into a, a Broadcom, which is going to be half enterprise, half system software and half selected. ASICs or special purpose ASICs in, in, in selected silos in semi. So we have opportunities to think about how to reposition within semis within this kind of turmoil. 
Uh, and so that it's, a, it's an intriguing area now and to think about how to be positioning for the next one or two years in, in this in this mess we're in right now. I think that, that what I'm saying is I think there's opportunity in the term. <laughs> I've got to watch the portfolio with interest. Um, switching tack a little bit, Meta is apparently looking to cut costs and lay off a, a bunch of workers. Um, how have you interpreted that, especially in the context of the size of the investment in the, the metaverse division? Well, you know, it's, they're not alone. We hear the same thing, believe it or not, from Google. You may have uh, you may have seen the headlines. Google employees did not like that message from the CEO when he told them. But uh, it's, so we've been hearing that message pretty much um, across the board. Look, Meta. But let's just call a spade a spade. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, it's his company. It's straight up his company. He controls it. Now, if you're like me, you think this guy has proven himself to be a visionary and has made good investment bets and is a value creator. And you say, well, I like the way he's moving quickly. He's allocating capital aggressively. He's very, I, I, I admire the way he comes on every earnings call himself. A lot of CEOs don't do that. He lays out his one year, three year, five year views. He talks about capital allocation. He talks about what's going right, what's going wrong. How they want to rule AI as being the absolute best developers for AI. And his vision of how the metaverse is going to be the next big com computing wave in the world. In, in the histories of technology and how he's positioning Meta to win in that environment and how it's going to be an expensive transition. I say this guy, okay, he's got a ton of cash flow, got a strong balance sheet, got an incredible amount of engineering capability. He's got 2 billion people who can understand what they're doing and, 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 and try to learn and influence. I think it's a good long-term risk reward. Obviously it's been a very bad stock this year. Uh, I think likely, on the other hand, look, if you don't like Zuckerberg or if you don't feel like letting him allocate the capital almost as if it's a private company aggressively, I get it. Then you don't want to be there. Now, cutting the, cutting the costs, I think, is a good sign. They've been, in, there's been too many projects in too many areas. And, and the only reason I say that is because he's already said it. He said, we have been, we are needing, we need to focus much more carefully now. And he's basically had leaked memos saying, if you don't like it here, you may leave to his employees. We want people who are really committed to our success in these areas, and we're going to be focusing. And, it's, and, 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 and so that's how I see it. Uh, it's a sign of focusing, and it's a sign of not trying to do all of these things across the landscape. Uh, remember, tremendous free cash flow, tremendous balance sheet, ton of engineering capability. Personally, I think it's a mistake to write it off. Uh, I wish I had sold it and bought it back after it went down 20%, but it's really hard to do that. Agreed. Ha have you spent much time personally in the metaverse? Because I must be honest, I can't get my head I have not. I have not. I, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on social media. I like technology companies, but I don't, I'm not. You can call me a Luddite in my personal life. You and me both. Um, What's your view of the European opportunities at the moment? And do you have any indirect exposure to Russia or, or Ukraine? Um, I think we have de minimis exposure to Russia or Ukraine. I can't imagine any at the moment. Most companies have had that had two, three percent have already written it down. So I don't think so. Uh, Europe, I think Europe personally, okay, don't take this the wrong way. I think it's kind of a basket case economically, politically. Um, that's a great place to visit. I love it. But personally, I, I, I just don't see it as a growth region. Uh, that, that, that's a generalization. Uh, couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't think more differently about the number of companies that we have access to. However, we see, I'm going to say at least in my view, a dozen very interesting global growth businesses in Europe today. Uh, you know some of them, the, the, the famous ones, the L'Oreal's uh, of, of the world, uh, absolute first class, uh, you know. But I, the ones that I see changing, that have the potential to change the most are really in the industrial area. 
uh, whether it's Schneider Electric, which is one of the global leaders in, in, in electrification and helping businesses radically uh, improve their energy efficiency in the way they, they build and run new facilities, new buildings, upgrading uh, all sorts of uh, buildings along with automation. And um, name like uh, Hexagon, which is in Sweden, but it's an absolute leader in, in the vanguard of the digitization of industry, which is finally ready for prime time. And a business like that is already generating almost half of its revenues in the recurring revenue software services model. That's from an industrial, it's making that transition to a higher quality revenue stream, a uh, higher margin, a much lower work networking capital. It's an amazing, it's a really an incredible transition they've made at that business. And we see the others following that. Uh, so I, I mean, Atlas Copco, leading in, in, a leading uh, industrial, you know, GenMap, which was a, it was a Danish company, is absolutely on the leadership vanguard of of cancer oncology breakthroughs. So I, I think there's a actually a pretty target rich group of globally competitive European businesses that happen to be domiciled within Europe. Uh, but Europe per se, to me, I wouldn't want to own an ETF on Europe. Okay, m m makes sense. Um, you, you guys are stock pickers after all. Um, and the US dollar has been exceptionally strong at the moment. But, you know, the stronger the dollar gets, the less competitive US manufacturing, there's a whole bunch of knock on effects. Um, ultimately, it's not going to stay strong forever. What are your thoughts about the whole the, the whole currency situation? Well, you know, we we struggle with that. We we um, we we've observed that. Uh, now, see, I'm looking at this from a U.S. dollar investor point of view. So, at the end of this, Adam, I'm going to ask you your thought, okay? Because 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 here's the here's the rub. For for us, for U.S. dollar investor, I I think you, you there's no you can't escape because let's say you own. I talked earlier today about Nike. So Nike is um, in constant, they just reported their earnings a little while ago, right? So in constant currency revenue, they're, they're generating something like 11% top line growth. In dollars, it's something like three, okay? So they had eight, an 800 basis point suppression there. Um, but as if we own Nike, we get hurt because the US investors say, oh, it's 3% growth, but they kind of know and in, in, in one way it's kind of 11, but it's three. On the other hand, let's say you own Adidas just picking up the number two in the industry in Germany, you say, oh, wow, you know, their, their US dollar revenues are gonna be worth more in euros, but you are a euro denominated company. So as a US dollar investor, you get nailed on the euro, right? You're down like 20%. So which one do you want? You wanna get hit on Nike on the 3% top line versus, or you wanna get hit on the Adidas and, and lose 20% definitely on the currency. I'd rather get hit on Nike because they can, because it, you, you look through a bit, you don't take the whole hit. The second thing I'd say, Adam, is a strong dollar, although I think people say it's generally negative for global growth and global liquidity, and it's not great for EM and all that, it, 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 it at the margin, it caps inflation in the United States. It, it makes important goods cheaper, right? And so anything in this point that can help get that inflation genie back in the bottle is a, is a straight up positive, so I'll take the strong dollar. Now, if you don't mind, how do you think about the strong dollar? Well, I mean, <laughs> I wasn't expecting to have that question. Um, well, so well, you can give it a pass. But I'm just saying, from a U.S. point of view, you can't escape it because you get hit on the, like in Japan, right? There's supposed to be all these Japanese beneficiaries of the of the weak yen, but we hold Japanese stocks and then we lose 30 percent of the currency. So they well, might get a little boost, but then you lose it on the currency as you know. So that that's that's as a U.S. dollar investor, you know. So but don't, don't worry, let's keep going. You know, that answer that. Well, well, well I'll, I'll just say this, that any global um, investment portfolio that has been underweight US for the last little while has had a massive headwind from being effectively short dollars. Um, but at the same time, we've, we've got to think that that's not going to last forever. And at some yeah. point, you would want to be overweighting the other regions and, and potentially catching a rebound there. And well, yeah, th that's an interesting point. It's about mean reversion. You know, for us, we don't look at regions. We look at quality growth companies that are comparable anywhere in the world, right? And so people say, well, you know, is Europe cheap versus the U.S., for example? In aggregate, it is, but 
that's as you know, that's not apples and apples because there's much higher quality growth businesses on average in the US than in Europe. So when you adjust for that, what we're looking for is where are quality growth businesses outside the US more attractively, attractively valued than in the US. And I think we're starting to see selected cases where Japanese companies, which have frequently looked more expensive, are beginning to look less expensive. And selected cases in Europe, quality growth in Europe can look expensive because of scarcity value in Europe. But I, you're right. I mean, I think we see those divergences narrowing and we're beginning to see maybe a little bit more valuation appeal, but not a lot, XUS, in my opinion. Another, another interesting question that's just come through is about Silicon Valley Bank. Um, it feels like Silicon Valley is in a world of pain at the moment and deal activity has fallen off a cliff. Why would we still want exposure to the bankers? Okay, we just added to it two weeks ago. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. So Silicon Valley Bank, uh, I, so I just looked at this um, yesterday, preparing for another meeting. We've owned it for the last 11 years. I think it's compounded at low teens rate, which by the way, if the last time I looked at this, when you look over the long term, it's compounded its book value per share, low double digits, um, earnings, same, with de minimis losses. And by the way, it's, it, it's another company, uh, another um, kind of secular growth financial called First Republic in the portfolio uh, that we've owned almost as long that has similar type of metrics. So Silicon Valley Bank, which as I said, been 11 years now, what you'll see over time is, okay, what is it? it it's got about over 50% market share in, in, in private equity venture capital in this country going at venture capital primarily going at early stage going into what's called, they call the innovation economy. So it's basically technology and, and, and healthcare life sciences. Uh, and it's, it's, it's where a lot of uh, growth and innovation and value creation has been coming from in, across the United States and, and even globally. And, and the company has absolutely developed a leading franchise where Entrepreneurs and backers want to work with it for all sorts of reasons of competence and connections. And Silicon Valley Bank is able to accumulate a lot of uh, low cost deposits, get a lot of attractive banking business. Um, and its balance sheet, they, their asset liability structure is such that they're highly levered to rising rates at the same time. But they also end up with a bunch of warrants on early stage companies and they'll get these, um, these bumpy gains. Now, what you'll see over the years is, is, um, is, is it, it, the business can be volatile at times if there's turning points in the funding cycles. But if you just smooth it out over time, it's been very strong secular growth uh, because in this country, there's been strong growth in innovation funding and in innovation. So in our view, and, and, and if you talk to Silicon Valley Bank, there's lots of different waves of innovation still to come. There's a record amount of dry powder on the sidelines and we expect to see venture and early stage money redeploy into companies at a valuation reset. And when we see that begin to happen, I think we'll see Silicon Valley shares uh, see a significant recovery. Well, you want to add to it when it's like this. Um, over, the, over the last decade, we've watched the hedge funds in particular at turning points. They'll either slam it for short-term vulnerability because they know it's fragile at, at, for any, any short period of time the stock can get hit. Conversely, when things are going well, when there's, a, when there's strength in the innovation economy, when rates are rising, they'll ramp it. And so what we've tried to do over the years is, is lighten up on Silicon Valley. We sold, we reduced some earlier this year when the stock gets a little bit more expensive. And then we know very well, it's coming down at some point in a, in a trans, which have always been transitional corrections so far. They're very hard to pick the bottom. So now about a week to 10 days ago, our analyst, Brian Lloyd, who's followed the name for the decade, he upgraded it to Best Buy. He said, my fair value on this thing is now 100% above current price. Nobody can pick the bottom, nobody we know, but I'm signaling that this is back in strong buy territory. And I decided, you know what? I was kind of feeling the same thing, but didn't have that final point. So added to the name. And, and, and so a lot, of the, the, a lot of the bad news and the uh, environment is in that stock. And uh, if, 
the last 10 years as any guide, we're going to have a very strong uplift in Silicon Valley bank shares again. Can't tell you when, but I, I, I do believe we'll see it. So I think it's a buy and hold and you got to be counter, counter cyclical on it. When everybody hates it, you add to it. When everybody loves it, you, have, you, you lighten up on it. But core holding, that's how I feel about NVIDIA. Okay, great. Well, I think in the, in the interest of time, we still do have some questions, but in the interest of time, I am going to wind up now. And if we didn't respond to your question, or at least a version of your question, because a lot of them were on similar themes, um, we will respond to you directly. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, the questions were great. So thanks to, to those who submitted them. Our next webinar in the series is 9 a.m. on the 18th with Steve Black, the co-portfolio of the Pengar Emerging Companies Fund. You can register for, for this webinar on our website, pengana.com. If you have any other questions, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much and enjoy your day. Thank you, everybody.